Good evening and welcome to UT Libraries and specifically here at the Perry Castaneda Library. Uh, my name is Lorraine Harricombe and I'm the Vice Provost and Director of UT Libraries. And it is particularly significant tonight that we will have this event in this library. This is the first building at UT that was named after two minority faculty in 1977. The first was Dr. Carlos Castaneda, who played a central role in the early development of the Benson Latin American collection, which is considered one of the world's, most, uh, world's foremost repositories of Latin American materials. And Dr. Irvin Perry, the first African American to be appointed at the rank of professor at the University of Texas at Austin in the engineering school. Tonight, we are honored by the presence of four very distinguished guests to help us identify the barriers that we still need to break down in civic and educational institutions and the opportunities to work together to sustain diversity and inclusivity in our community. In a few minutes, I will introduce them briefly in the order in which they will speak. Their bios are in the programs that you've seen on your chairs, and I need to make just one quick announcement about the mayor. You see he's not here, right? Um, he will join us. He is at the University of Hudson Tillotson right now. He has not left there. He will join us closer to 6.30 tonight. So when he comes, he will immediately join us. And we'll give him an opportunity um, also to speak. So I will be the moderator for this program tonight. And uh, let me just explain to you the order of the program. To use our time effectively, we will kick off the program with each panelist providing a brief statement of their work in diversity and inclusivity. I will then ask them a few questions. And the last 10 or 15 minutes, we will reserve for questions from the floor. And then we will wrap up, wrap up at about 8 o'clock, hopefully. And we will have informal discussion over cookies and coffee until about 8.30. Okay. So if you'd like to engage any of the speakers after 8 o'clock, they'll be here. Thank you. So our first speaker is the mayor, who is not here, and so I'll reserve uh, my time to introduce um, him when he arrives here. Our first speaker tonight will be Dr. Gregory Vincent, a national expert on civil rights, social justice, and campus culture. And he is the vice president for diversity and community engagement as well as the W.K. Keller Professor of Community College Leadership and Professor of Law for just a few more weeks at UT Austin. For perhaps you know, just last week, his alma mater, Hobart and Smith Colleges in upstate New York, named him as their new president, effective July 27. Congratulations, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. be a big loss for the university. Dr. Julie Todaro, an Austinite and president of the American Library Association, the oldest and largest associ library association in the world, has won numerous awards for her work and advocacy for all types of libraries. You will see her bio in the program as well. And Dr. Ling Wei Cheng, who is the president of the Texas Library Association, the largest state library association, of course, with Texas, in the country. She also has won numerous awards. She's the director of the Texas Women's University um, Library and Information School and is a regular speaker on issues of diversity. Both of them, as you have heard, are professionals in the library and information profession. Both of them bring a deep understanding of libraries as centers of social consciousness and community involvement. And they are strong advocates for smart public libraries invest for smart public investment in libraries. Thriving communities depend on libraries. So without further ado, I will ask Dr. Vincent to have a brief statement, about two to three minutes. We'll give you a little extra time, but we'll 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 make sure that we get through all three. Well, thank you for this very gracious invitation. Uh, it is truly an honor to be here. I feel so at home in a library. 
Um, I've shared before that my parents gave me uh, three priceless gifts. One of those gifts is a love of reading, and our home was filled with books. And growing up in New York City, one of the moments that I felt most empowered was when I got my first library card. And the ability to say, I could check out that book, but I was also responsible for those books. And, and then the one place I could go, if I said I was going to the New York Public Library, my parents said, you can go. So the idea of, <laughs> of going down to Manhattan and, and being able to go and spend hours there, uh, and it's just a moment of awe. And, and we had a, a, a UT event at the library, and it just brought wonderful moments back. And so for me, libraries are a special, special place, and so it's always good to be in the, in, the, in the library. And there's something special about getting a book, right? Going and checking it out, right? And having your name in the, uh, in the list. I was one of those persons who read that book. And so it's a really special place. So thank you for this opportunity to be here this evening. OK. You want to um, speak a little bit about your role after that sure. WDBCE. Yeah. yeah. So I, as, as, as mentioned, I, I serve as Vice President for Diversity and Community Engagement. I was appointed by President uh, William Powers, and he asked me to do two things. One, to make this campus more inclusive, to make sure that this was the place where everyone could bring their whole selves to the campus. And for me, the thing that still inspires me is to make sure that everyone loves their alma mater. and that we live up to our mission, that we serve the people of Texas, the nation, and the world. Thank you. I'm trying to stay in those two minutes. I know how, how quickly two minutes can <laughs> fly by. OK. Thank you very much. Dr. Tadaro. Libraries are my business, and uh, I'm passionate about them from a business perspective, I think, more so than anything else. Uh, I am the dean of library services at Austin Community College, and as such, I'm the first community college president um, of the American Library Association. So that's been an interesting transition, more for them, I think, than for me. <coughs> the, uh, the interest that I have is uh, obviously diversity and inclusion, but from a number of different perspectives. Libraries, whether they're academic, public, school, or special, are incredibly unique buildings in that they are if you think about it, the only facility that is open a significant number of hours for which there's no charge to come in and stay and be productive or uh, discover or uh, produce, research, relax. And as such, we have different practices and uh, policies than other people do. So it's, it's extremely unique to have to operate a business that has such a different kind of footprint in the community. It is, uh, I think it's one of the hardest things to do. Nonprofits are extremely difficult to manage, but I find that uh, we are among uh, the most inclusive uh, because that's why we're there. We're there because 25% of the people in the United States do not have access to technology at home. And those numbers from Pew Research were really low when they did them. So I'm very interested in diversity in general. And the last thing I'll say is that uh, I was president of the ACRL, which is the Association of, of College and Research Libraries, in 2007. And we commissioned a number of white papers that were on diversity and inclusion. And while they were interesting policy statements, to me, they weren't good guidance for practice. So I began <clears throat> to look at documents much as I did the Austin one from a presence of a rubric. How can you judge that? And how do we get to inclusiveness? So I have four things that I measure everything against, and there are four Ps. Presence, policy, practice, and perception, which are the four steps toward uh, moving an institution or an organization or a business from uh, lack of inclusiveness, lack of realization of diversity in the community, and get there. Uh, presence means people have to see themselves in the institution prior to feeling inclusive and wanted, which I think the Austin document did especially well. 
policy has to be in place, and uh, they have to be genuine, broad, as well as descriptive, specific policies. Practice follows policy and needs to be required uh, practice. And then perception is one of the key things, where your perception is that you are welcomed, and signage works, and you feel at home, and uh, we said we already see ourselves there, but that we feel welcomed by the presence of resources or services. So I judge everything against those four, and I'll mention that a little later when I talk about some of the work we're doing at the national level for assisting libraries in defining their role in sanctuary. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dr. Jane? I'm going to stand up so you can see me. <laughs> <laughs> Julie or, you know, uh, Angela, and uh, so the other day a student called the office and uh, she couldn't remember who she talked to, so she told the staff, I talked to that woman with heavy uh, foreign accent, and so that there was only one person that would remotely fit into that description. And, um, I've been on my job as the director of the School of Library and Information Studies for 14 years. After three years, I got a new boss who advised me I should avoid speaking in public. And she even started drafting my emails because she thought I couldn't really speak or write in English. And, um, and so, I had a career in higher education for about three decades now. Um, a few publications under my belt, you know, a few presentations, um, maybe about almost 100. And, um, <laughs> and, and so what I kept thinking was which part of my English that I couldn't do. And, uh, and I still couldn't figure it out. And um, my first job was in Maryland uh, College Park, and the first the first semester, I had a student who claimed that he was a reporter for the student newsletter, a newspaper, and so he came and interviewed me, and he said, how are you different from those Chinese immigrants in 19th century who came over to open the saloon and, and being the prostitute and, and all those things for the gold diggers? I have no answer because I didn't know much about the history at that time. And I didn't even know that I was supposed to be angry. I went to UCLA, that was the first time I actually attended an, uh, an, a lecture on feminism. Suddenly realized that women actually had problems. You know, we women had questions, had issues. And, uh, and then I went, in, I went to a film festival that um, they show the golden pieces, the thousand pieces of gold, which is a expression of the most precious daughter. Uh, that's actually a, a movie. After the movie, there was a discussion, and somebody in the audience asked the question, why is it that Asian actors have to die at the end of the movie? <laughs> Nobody had an answer to that either. And so, <clears throat> I went to Kentucky and um, the, I was trying to find a job because my husband got the job there. And I went to the school and talked to the, uh, the, the administrator and he said, oh no, we already have a lowest chain, we don't need another one. And, um, and so, you know, there are all this kind of things. I came to TW, Texas Women's University and um, I just happened to have a Caucasian boyfriend who was like 6'3", or that kind of thing. And a lot of women look at me like, why are you hooking up with a white person? And so that, again, was a problem. 
course evaluation is always a problem. Somebody would always tell me that I have cultural problems. I, I don't understand the culture. And so when I look at that, my personal identity is a combination of so many diversity factors. It mm -hmm. race, gender, physical appearance, cultural traditions, and immigration, just to name a few. That's and fantastic. in the grand scheme of life in the United States and in America, and, and basically work in higher education, I am actually not unusual. I'm very ordinary. And that's where I begin to see myself that it's not just me. And um, I was listening to Pope Francis' TED Talk and the, the word that, that, that stuck with me was he kept asking himself, why them, when he saw people in the poverty, why them and not me? And he talked about the solidarity, solidarity, that it's really about people, it's not about goods, it's not about material, it's about people. Thank and you, Dr. Jane. So that's, that's the kind of thing that gave me the, the background to come into this conversation. Thank you so much for telling your personal story. So we've heard some of the experiences of somebody who is not an American, somebody who came here. But many of us, and I'm referring to Austin in particular, have been here a while. I've not been, but many of us in the audience have been. A true Austinites like you was born here. Was born I'm here. The only one in the room, I'll bet you. <laughs> My age. Any other Austinites in the born room? Here? Oh yeah. Very few. Okay. We'll yeah. meet after. <laughs> so what? So, um, Dr. Tadaro, why don't we start with um, you? Anybody can jump in. Certainly. What are some of the persistent barriers that need to be rooted out right here in Austin for us, all Austinites to thrive? We have a problem recruiting professionals to Austin. Um, we have a problem getting um, staff to stay in Austin because of the affordability issue. And I, I wish the mayor was here. I know he ran on an affordability uh, platform. But it is, uh, it is a very difficult place to be successful. Um, I, I pay very well at, for my jobs, but um, being able to recruit couples uh, spouses, uh, people who are in a family to come here and live here and have a quality of life is a, a major barrier to anyone. Um, and in my profession, we have a very small percent of people who are of color, ethnic uh, backgrounds, very small. And so it's a highly competitive area. Uh, so I would say the first barrier to the profession in general is we're not the highest paid profession in the world. We love it, but you know, we don't, we're not in it for the money. The affordability in this particular location and the, um, the competitiveness that we have for those people who we do need to have in the organization. I, I, keep, I feel that keenly in a community college mm -hmm. where we have large uh, numbers, uh, high representation of a wide variety of people. And so I'm, I feel compelled to recruit, but I have barriers for that. Again, you're, you're so right about uh, uh, Mayor Adler and his real um, attention to the um, economic stratification, you know, being one of the most economically segregated cities. And so we see how that impacts some of our students because one of the big concerns we have at UT Austin is that our students at times have very different experiences. And we have some students who live close to campus in beautiful residences, and we have others who are being pushed out further and further. And so it becomes a commuter um, university for them. So that's certainly a uh, significant issue. I think the other thing is staying attuned to what's currently going on, but being having a keen understanding of the past, that these issues have roots, historical roots, and that uh, the, some of the reasons why we see some of these persistent inequalities are rooted in uh, government-sponsored uh, exclusion, uh, and that and so we have to pay attention 
uh, to those issues, even and UT's role in that, and and even as we went across the, um, uh, I-35 and the and understanding how and why, and why sometimes there is a negative perception of the University of Texas at Austin. Fortunately, uh, we have uh, uh, we have paid attention to that, and that's something that I know certainly. Uh, uh, we've worked on both with President Powers and President Fenves over these last 12 years. But I would say that economic issue, housing, is so fundamental because that, that really drives so many of the other inequalities. That's where you go to school. That's access to jobs. And so health care, there are still food deserts here in, in, in parts of this community. So I would say that those issues, even, even though I think rightfully so, and I think we all are very uh, excited and proud to live in Austin, but even with that, there are some, still some significant issues and barriers. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to speak about Austin, um, but I'm going to just say that a big part of the barrier is really the individual tension between wanting to belong to our own group and mm -hmm. wanting to be the be assimilated, be want be part of the, the the majority group. A lot of times, that's the hardest part. And technology makes it so easy for me to fly to Taiwan to see my family five times a year, which is which is what I do. But, but I also want to be the integral part of this community, this culture. And a lot of times it's that tension that I feel like I'm not a true American, but also I also am not a Taiwanese anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's the tension inside each one of us um, when we feel like we belong, but we don't belong. Uh, and let me add that uh, part of assimilation in a community is being able to form a network and, and have uh, uh, recreational and leisure activities. Mm -hmm. But in Austin, Dairy Queen pays more per hour than I do, and I pay very well. But that's frightening because that means that in order to live here, you have to have at least one, if not two, part-time jobs to go to school. And we're seeing an increasing number of higher education institutions set up uh, food uh, banks. And it is, uh, we're just pricing ourselves out. The cost of textbooks is astronomical. Mm -hmm. Can you do something about that? I mean, this is <laughs> now. Uh, and uh, just the whole cost of technology and staying up is extremely expensive. And the more you have to work to live somewhere, the less you can acculturate yourself. I, I just, it's ironic that you should be asking about the price of textbooks. ACC is doing wonderful work in the area of open educational resources exactly to reduce the cost of yeah. textbooks and We're, education. We will have two degrees by the fall that are all open educational textbooks. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, the library is the co-chair of that committee. And our goal is to reduce that. I mean, who can afford $2,000 in textbooks right. for a philosophy class, mm -hmm. you know? Sorry. Well, thank you for leading. You know, it's hard to the philosophers in the room. And our mayor has arrived. Mayor Steve Adler, please join us. I thought you should be played. Yes. You we, we knew all about you. Good to see you. So, uh, I th is there anything else you wanted to add to that particular comment? No? So let me take a minute now to um, introduce somebody in Austin who doesn't need any introduction at all, but I have notes because I do want to um, do this very formally. Um, we started without you. You were supposed to be our first speaker, Mayor Adler. But Mayor Adler was sworn into the office in January 2015. That's the time I arrived in Austin. But this is what I like about what I read about you, during your short tenure, he's already earned a reputation as a disruptive leader for his tenacity to take on difficult issues. And here's the quote that I particularly liked. For much of my life, I have recognized race as a force in my own life and in our society. While racism is not the only factor contributing to the diminished capacity, capacity of all people, it is the factor which so many people of power and authority fail to effectively recognize, understand, 
or address. I am now leading the city in learning how to recognize, understand, and address racism at its various levels, personal, institutional, structural, and systemic. Thank you for being here and for being on this platform to help us better understand what some of the barriers are that persistent in Austin and how we can work together to root them out. So Thank with you. that, I would like to give you a chance to give us a brief statement about uh, the work and the report that has just been released on this issue last month um, and to share with us um, what some of those recommendations are that might be priorities for you to tackle first. All right. Um, thank you for inviting me to, to participate with such a, such a wonderful panel. Uh, I apologize for, 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 for walking in late. Uh, the conversation you're having here, I think, is a real important conversation to have, especially in a, in a city like Austin. Uh, we're not a city of, of racists. We were not uh, a city... Uh, the people here were not the ones that, that created the system uh, back in 1928 where we developed a land plan that sent different people uh, of, of different colors to different parts of our city to, to live. But the, the, the remnants of that plan, the vestiges of that plan persist uh, in our city and, and we are the ones who are here now and have the ability and the responsibility to, to change things. Last summer, uh, we had uh, uh, another one of the, uh, the, the incidents that have occurred in our city uh, between um, our law enforcement uh, uh, folks and, and, and people of, of color in our city. Uh, there have been too many of, of those incidents. And there was a uh, response that this city had that, that, I'm, that I'm proud of. Uh, in that we were able at that moment to gather together uh, people from, from different parts of the community to, to engage in, in, in a very meaningful conversation. But at some point, you need more than a meaningful conversation in response to these kinds of things. And, and you need more than, 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 than random acts of equity to to respond. So what grew out of that event last summer was a desire to actually do something that would be real specific and concrete and meaningful. I looked at what President Obama had done uh, with his um, uh, community policing uh, initiative where uh, in response to uh, uh, similar kinds of events that he was seeing in his position much higher than mine, uh, he had pulled together a group of the community and he had said, I want more than a meaningful conversation. I want more than another exercise that helps define the challenges and the problems that we have. I want to know what we can do. I want really specific things that we can do. And he put together a, a pretty strong panel and he gave them a very short period of time to come back and respond and they did. And, and a lot of what they recommended, we have tried to implement in this city, as have cities across the country. So in response to what happened in Austin, uh, I said I wanted to do the same thing here. But I wanted to do it a little bit differently than, than I had seen other cities and, frankly, the president do it. Because the same issues that we face institutionally with respect to criminal justice in this city are similar to issues we face in civil justice in this city, are similar to issues that we face in access to capital in this city, and housing in this city, and the delivery of health care in this city, and education in this city. It's not an issue which is uh, only in any one of those areas. So I went to uh, two friends of mine, uh, two, I think, of the of the really strong leaders that we have in the community. Uh, the first was um, uh, Dr. Burnett, uh, Colette Pierce Burnett, the president of Houston Tillotson. And I went to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Cruz, uh, Paul Cruz, superintendent of schools with AISD. Went to these two doctors uh, and I asked them if they would pull together a, a community, group from the community, a task force to come back to 
the larger community with really specific things we could do. And I told them I wanted to form a task force and I wanted to call it a task force on institutional racism and systemic inequities, mm -hmm. because that's what it was. Uh, I am and will always be forever grateful for them stepping into that to pick up a topic, the mere title of which causes many people to, to back away. Uh, uh, when I formed the task force, uh, there were a lot of people in the community that came to me and suggested that I use a different name for the task force that would be less polarizing or inflammatory. I said it would also be less descriptive. And, <laughs> and, and, and the pushback that, that we were getting at that level was the very first real indication that it had to be named that and this panel needed to, in fact, uh, 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 convene in that way. So literally just a couple weeks ago, the panel came back with uh, over, uh, over 100 different recommendations. They created working groups and verticals in each of the areas that I talked about. Uh, they made recommendations back to an umbrella uh, uh, task force that went through that work. Uh, and I think uh, as a postscript, that report came out on, on, a, on a Friday. Uh, the city council was considering our Austin's uh, strategic uh, housing uh, plan or, or blueprint, uh, which, which is a really good document. It had been worked on in the community for almost two years, involving stakeholder groups from all over the city. It was in front of the city council to be approved 10 days after the report came out. The report came out, had a section on housing. And it became real apparent that this report that had been two years in the making, the strategic plan, did not, did not have it right uh, and had not taken into account the things that it needed to and had not prioritized all the things that it needed to prioritize. And we changed that report, which we would not have done absent the work of that task force. And I hope that that task force sees itself manifested in very specific and concrete ways, not just in, in government. If you read those recommendations, a lot of them pertain to, to, to the, the business world, the corporate world. Mm -hmm. uh, it pertains to the nonprofit world. It pertains to organizations. It pertains to people. It is not just government. In fact, it is mostly not government. Right. Uh, and I think that's important too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have read the report too, and tonight we have on the stage, on the platform with you, two presidents of very large library associations, Texas Library Association, the largest state library association, and Dr. Julie Tadaro, the president of the American Library Association, the largest in the world. Um, and I've asked them to come because we also wanted to hear a little bit about about um, the role libraries can play in fostering inclusivity um, across the shifting demographics of a city experiencing you know, uncontrollable growth like Austin. And so um, I would like to give Dr. Tadaru a minute um, to three, four minutes to speak to uh, that. Our association, we have about 57,000 members from all the countries in the world. Uh, majority of them are in the United States and it's a very diverse organization. We had a, a number of goals for our work, but diversity was not a goal. It was discussed at the time of the strategic plan, and it was universally decided and then written into the concept of the plan that there were underpinnings or an infrastructure where everything needed to go forward. And so diversity was on that level. But we flipped that conversation. I guess about a year ago, after Pulse Nightclub in Florida, we came in as the first first group to meet in Florida after that uh, incident. And so um, we changed our goals to include diversity because the the prevailing thought is that if no one is responsible for it, then it doesn't get done. It has to be uh, stated as a goal. So we flipped that, and then we had a huge number of, of libraries predominantly public, main large libraries, but a huge number of academics as well, and some school, who felt that they had a role to play in sanctuary cities. And so we, uh, I asked our attorney to come up with a series of definitions 
because the idea of a sanctuary city is not defined in law, uh, it's defined more in practice. So what we did was come up with a document that talked about exactly what you're saying, the role that libraries play. We're centers for public discourse, much as this, uh, completely inclusive, and so what we're doing is parsing out those very specific things, meeting rooms that can be used with individuals who need to meet with attorneys for immigration, programs on immigration, uh, programs on affordability in the community. And one of the approaches that librarians like to take is sort of the bibliotherapy through reading that you had mentioned. And libraries have a one book, one city. Austin has had that before. They tend to be uh, entertainment. But now you'll see, for example, Santa Monica's One Book, One City is the book Evicted, which is about homelessness and the problem with homelessness. Um, so now we see cities through libraries starting that public discourse around content that is aimed at the, the most inclusive thing that you can provide for a discussion. Outside facilitators to come in, read the book, experience it. Um, throughout the city. So uh, I think uh, our toolkit, which I hate to use because it's really hackneyed, but we have an immigration toolkit, a sanctuary city toolkit that we're just getting ready to put up that really talks about how libraries can make a meaningful difference in cities that are sanctuary cities, but frankly, cities that aren't. And with a lot of the politics we have lately in this state and nationally, uh, uh, more will not be sanctuary than are. And so what we want to do is talk about how libraries are environments for public discourse and discussion for everyone and how we don't need the sanctuary designation to start and possibly make inroads in those conversations. So, so far. Yeah. <laughs> also wanted to this is probably more for you, Dr. Vincent. I'll come back to the, to the role of libraries in, in Austin in particular. Well, maybe I should go there right now because um, we have both TLA and ALA here. So how can public libraries here in Austin in particular benefit from what you had just said? How can we make that happen here in well, Austin? Well, first we need to get it open. Yeah. That's our first thing. Um, <laughs> sorry, and Mayor Adler, can just put this. La, 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 la. So, <laughs> I've, I've it's been close. On the board, I've been on their board and I've been on their foundation group. And uh, it's uh, major cities need major public libraries. That's that's a given. It's a um, it's an issue of downtown economic development. Like our main topic is libraries mean business, and uh, that business needs to be in downtown. So. The, the library in design right now has a huge um, feeling of inclusiveness and spaces designed for that. Mm -hmm. So as soon as it gets open, and that's the last joke I'll make. Um, <laughs> in my lifetime, I lied, it wasn't the last joke. <laughs> <laughs> we will really, uh, that will immediately step up with their director, Tony. Uh, she's committed to this as well. She's from Houston. and. Um, I think the entire staff is ready to deliver that kind of discourse in their new setting. Excellent. Okay. Do you want to respond to that? You or oh. the mayor? Yes. Go first. Um, uh, when you, the, the, for, uh, the first thing is that libraries have always been the most trusted place mm -hmm. in public. And people who have some personal concerns, they would go to the library to look for information. They might, a lot of times, they are actually much more comfortable talking to librarians than talking to their own doctor or their, their or, or other professionals. That's a one very important thing to, a, re, a very important reason just to keep the libraries open. But as you read a lot of the reports, um, the diversity and inclusiveness reports, in a lot of different places, and I, I kind of scanned through it, and almost all the recommendations fall into three categories, education, income, and health. And then the, the role of the government is really about laws, uh, making laws, and law enforcement. And so from, from the government's perspective, they 
the laws needs to be there, and we are the ones who need to advocate, all of us need mm -hmm. to advocate for the right kind of laws, inclusive laws. But from library's perspective, it's important for us to see that we have a big role in education, income, and health. And our role is going to be to work with the community nonprofits, the faith-based nonprofit, community-based nonprofits, to really work in all different coalitions for education causes, for income causes, and for health initiatives both health, physical health, and mental health. That's one very important part of it, and where people can get the most trusted sources for any one of those, that's in the libraries. Thank you. The first thing I would say is that we're getting really close with the library. <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually moving in furniture. Uh, and it, it is and such an incredibly exciting space uh, to, to, to walk in. Uh, it is everything you would expect of a community investment of $130 million to build the library of the, of the next generation, of, the next, of this next century. Uh, it is just incredibly uh, exciting. Uh, more generally, the question uh, in terms of, of what do libraries add or what do they do uh, you know, libraries, in, in a very real sense, I think, are, are one of the, the places where, where democracy is, mm -hmm. is, is, is cultivated uh, and formed, and, and, it's, and it's so important in that respect. Uh, I asked my staff just to, to quickly write down some of the things that happen in, in, in the public libraries uh, in, in our city. Uh, you know, the public libraries offer um, uh, diverse range of programs and materials. They offer extensive collections in world languages, uh, in Spanish, in Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, um, uh, Hindi, Arabic, French, German, Italian. Uh, and this is where uh, large members of our community go uh, to, find, uh, to find those resources. We have multilingual programs, active programs for people to participate in, language practice groups, dual language story times, bilingual computer classes, uh, and bilingual technology assistance. Our website includes a very uh, extensive user-friendly uh, Spanish language uh, interface, making it easy for um, uh, one of the largest um, uh, groups of our community population to access uh, library uh, uh, services. It's a third of our population. Uh, language access is available for any individual who needs assistance in their primary language. They offer regular programs in partnership with the University of Texas Humanities uh, program. Uh, two are the most popular are Controversy and Conversation, which is a monthly documentary service. Uh, democracy and Action Reading discussion groups take place in the library. Uh, this spring, we partnered with uh, Umlauf uh, 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 Garden uh, Library to provide a series of art classes uh, for um, uh, uh, schools in the southeast part of our town so that uh, fourth to ninth graders that don't have access to uh, uh, art programs uh, were able to take art classes. The uh, library plays a critical role in the city's digital inclusion uh, program uh, in the city, making sure that everybody in the, in the city uh, can, can breach that, that, that barrier, computer literacy efforts computer classes, technology assistance. We provide large segments of our population access to computers and to Wi-Fi uh, that they don't otherwise have. We have connected youth centers at 10 libraries. We offered over 400 technology-related classes. 3,000 people attained, attended those language practice uh, classes that we had. At the Carver and, and the Willie Mae Kirk branches, we helped uh, over 3,000 individuals use technology uh, including assistance for job skills, entrepreneurship, and efforts to further education. You know, when we go into communities and we're trying to get people trained in jobs and to avail themselves of, of opportunities to be able to advance their standing and that of their family, uh, a lot of that takes place in our public libraries. That's where, where large members of our community find jobs, where they find job training. 
Uh, we have uh, my library keeps me healthy social service appointments um, where, where individuals can go into our public libraries to find access to and, and to meet uh, social service organizations and entry points into social service organizations. And I won't bother you with the rest of the list, but, but it could go on forever, mm -hmm. the kinds of things that happen. And when you think about the populations uh, that, this, that the library serves that would not be served in our community anywhere else yeah. uh, if we didn't have that function, it's about democracy at a basic level. Thank you so much, uh, Maria Adler. I promise at the beginning that we will have about 10 minutes or so and we're right at that mark to have questions from the audience to any of our panelists here tonight. So the floor is open to you for questions you may have to anyone. And there's a microphone up in the center here if you would like to walk up so everybody can hear you. Please do. to all the panelists. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, my name is Matt Stevenson. I'm the executive director and co-founder of Go to College. We're a local Austin nonprofit, and we equip girls, low-income students, and students of color with technical and professional skills to compete globally. Um, and so one of the things that we do is we partner with local companies. We bring our students out to them for uh, office visits, but we also place them into paid summer internships. And so one thing that we've been um, struggling with articulating is the value proposition to businesses uh, who are, whose focus is maximizing shareholder value. Mm -hmm. uh, just what is the value proposition of diversity? I understand what it is for an academic institution, diversity of thought, diversity of background and experience, but when you're talking about producing products and services better, faster, cheaper. Um, how does diversity uh, lend itself to that? Do you mind if I take a sure. crack at that? <clears throat> well, first of all, thank you for the great work that you're doing in the community. We really do appreciate that. Many of you know we uh, successfully, the University of Texas successfully defended uh, the use of race as one factor in admissions and had great support from a, a variety of sectors, one being the business community and uh, a group of uh, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies said that one of the most important skills they were looking for in 21st century professional workers is the ability to work in cross-cultural teams. That in, in this global economy, global society, we needed people who understood the global context. And so this idea that having people who understood that. We also know that great companies thrive in great communities. And if you have uh, communities that are racially stratified, socioeconomically stratified, it is not going to grow and, and prosper. I lived in a community where that, that uh, economic stratification and racial stratification was still present. They still had not resolved the uh, school desegregation case from 1955. And you could see how it drained the community but when the business community stepped in, the, the Chamber of Commerce and other interested leaders, it really did make a huge difference and they were able to attract um, um, new businesses because fundamentally when, when businesses and jobs come in, the thing they're looking for are their good educational systems. And so the proposition is uh, to produce uh, professional workers who understand the global context and to have businesses in a well-educated community that value the goods and services that the companies provides and produces. Mm -hmm. I, I would also say that um, my staff need to experience that for themselves because we spend more time at work awake than we do with our loved ones or at home. Uh, so the most amount of time that you can bring people together who are different, the better prepared they are, just personally. I think your teams are the best that are well-rounded, and although it's great to live next door to someone, and that's the ideal, most of us spend most of our time at work. So I want the most diverse staff so that not only do our customers, as I said before, see themselves, I want them to know what it's like to live and work globally in that team. And I have jobs. If you want to give me your card, I'd love to hire some of the women. I wrote a lot of business cards. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Can I, can I say something? Sure. Um, values of diversity to business all comes down to money. And it comes down to employable population. When you have a population with 63% Caucasian and 37% minority, I always use this example. If I give you $101 bills, would you take only 63 or would you take 100? Diversity is about money. It's about whether you are willing to settle for 63% of the human resources in this community, or you're willing to strive to use 100% of the human resources. It's about money. And what happened in, uh, I live in Denton County, of north of Dallas. What we did, we have a big manufacturing company called Peter Belt that built 18 wheeler and you know, all the big truck. And what they did was they could not find employable workforce locally, so they had to bus people from Oklahoma during the peak season. And whose loss is that? It's the local economy. So what they did was they came to nonprofit and they asked, how can we better educate all the people? It doesn't really matter what race, doesn't really matter what class, how can we better educate them so, they, so that they could read, they could write, they could, read, they could use a spreadsheet, and we will hire them. It's all about money. Okay, so, so this is interesting. So, you know, I, we've been respectful here because it's a library. We were taught to be quiet and genteel, right? <laughs> so, who said so, that? So, and, 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 I have, and I have the greatest respect, but I have to respectfully disagree. Okay. So, I don't think it's all about money. I think, I think good practices lead to good outcomes. But at, at its core, it has to be about values and who we are as a people. I think doing the right things the right way lead to good outcomes. When the city of Atlanta made the decision to say we are, because of moral reasons, that, and, and, and adopted the slogan, a city too busy to hate, then good business came as a result of that. But it was that decision that we are going to live as one another. And, and I think for me, I, I, I can't, to me, tying it solely to money, um, I think shortchange is the power of the goodness of people and wanting to live together, doing the right things the right way. I know that sounds Pollyannish, but I, but I do think that it's, it's the, I think it's the goodness that leads to those good, positive economic outcomes. Thank you. I'm gonna give um, one more question a chance, and then we will wrap up. My name is Gavino Fernandez, and I'm an Austin native, uh, born and raised in East Austin all my life, uh, 62 years. And uh, I just want to say that we have a great neighborhood libraries uh, because when I was growing up, we had some uh, adjacent or in the, in the recreation centers. Mm -hmm. Obviously, things change. But I always credit people that try to make change in the way the culture is in Austin. Uh, it, is a very, it is a segregated city. And it is a racist city. Now, we need to work to change that. And I think that if we don't accept that, then, then that's when we have problems. But I, I'm not one to criticize people's efforts in trying to do that. Uh, I'm also, we're also uh, charter members of UT Elementary. When UT Elementary wanted to go to the barrio and nobody wanted them, AISD didn't want them, our trustee didn't want them, the senator didn't want them, we went and punted for UT elementary. Fifteen years later, we try to reach out again, and there's no response. So basically what I want to say is that we need more work. Yeah. We need UT to work and extend their resources to, U to East Austin. Because I always question, in our community, we're wealthy with education, UT, St. Edwards, Concordia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. ACC. Yeah. ACC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But why do we still have Eastside Memorial failing? Mm -hmm. So 
uh, I just want to encourage you to continue reaching out to us. Uh, we may not be the high class money making people of this, of this community, but our people are very humble, very educated. And all we want to do is enhance their qualities of education yes. because they're bilingual, they're by culture. Yes. So that, that's all I am. And every time that I hear something about this, going to talk about us and at UT, I said, oh my God, what's going to happen next? <laughs> because I always told Dr. Birdall, he's the one that got us hooked up with UT Elementary, that we wanted more than to be a social incubator for UT. Yeah. Yeah. Because every year we get different students that want to see. I'm being sarcastic, but a lot of times that's the way it ends up being. But I commend you, Mayor, I commend you for your efforts. And all we can do is, uh, again, it's easy to criticize. Mm -hmm. And I also used to be a chief of staff or a county commissioner. So I've been at a governance level as well. So, but uh, that's the only thing I have to say is that we, we need to do more work. And libraries are beautiful. I wish we had as many libraries in our barrios like we have recreation centers. Mm -hmm. But it's not happening. Thank, so thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. particular administration in Washington uh, is uh, zeroing out all federal money for libraries. The, uh, one of the 19 agencies that zeroed out uh, prospectus is the Institute for Museum and Library Services, where the seat of all native collections and native support for libraries in the country is <coughs> all the blind and physically handicapped money from the federal government for library services. So. Uh, if you don't do anything else today, if you would go to uh, ALA Fight for Libraries. It's one page. It's a funnel page. We have an air table. We went through the House of Representatives last week, and we got a third of them to sign on and commit to having us as their primary goal, or one of their first three. The Senate is who we're attacking now. I head to Washington on Saturday to try to meet with people. It is a dark and lonely place. This is not about Republicans, it's not about Democrats, it's about libraries and trying, for me, and trying to make sure that people understand the return on investment and the value, no matter what color you are. So I really would like it if uh, you all would consider going and sending an email or calling your senator at this point and asking them to support our initiatives. Thank you. Let's support that call for action. Thank you. Thank you. all so much for coming here tonight. Um, as I mentioned, we will have uh, time and uh, refreshments at the back of the room until about 8.30 or so for informal discussion with any of our panelists here. And I really appreciate your coming out tonight to um, join us in this very important conversation. And I hope you will join me in, in saying libraries rock. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs>